You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Manchester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. I want to just share a few thoughts uh, today uh, about prayer. I know that those of you who've been coming along to the evening uh, sessions, you've been thinking together about prayer, but this is the absolute heart of having a relationship with God. If, If I said to you, I don't really talk to my wife and I don't listen to her, you might question whether we have a good marriage. Listen, if you have a relationship with God, you're going to need to talk to him, you're going to need to listen to him. And I kind of got hijacked by prayer 23 years ago, and now I'm one of the leaders of a a global movement of prayer. We've been praying nonstop since 1999, and we're in over 100 nations. And so I just want to try and distill a few things I've learned down uh, for you today. So uh, if you're able to do so, uh, would you mind standing for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read together Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 32. Mark 6, 30 to 32. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Amen. Do please be seated. Well, I don't know how you are feeling today. I don't know how life is going for you today. But if you read the whole of this chapter, Mark chapter 6, you find out that Jesus and the disciples have got every kind of stress that is going on in their lives. First of all, we see in this chapter that they are under pressure from fear and pain because Jesus has been rejected in his hometown. His family have effectively misunderstood him. Some of you know what that feels like to be misunderstood or even rejected by your own family. And then Jesus' cousin John has been executed. So that is uh, trauma. It is grief. And it's not just the grief of, you know, someone has died of old age. He has had his head chopped off by the most powerful man in the land. So this is frightening. Jesus is thinking, is it responsible to be leading my disciples in doing what we're doing? Is it going to be us next? So this is trauma, it's bereavement, it's grief, it's anxiety, it's misunderstanding. And then also in this chapter, you find out that Jesus and his disciples are under another kind of stress. And that is the pressure, not of pain and of fear, but of success. Who here knows that success can bring more stress into your life at times than opposition? And so uh, the disciples have just been sent out on an incredible mission trip. And they've come back with this amazing report. Many have been healed. Many people have been set free. In in, in Hollywood, you know, they write movies like you have a happy start, then you have a tragedy, you have a happy ending. But who knows, life isn't like that. The good, the bad and the ugly hit you between the eyes 25 times before breakfast every day. And the most complicated question anyone can ever ask you is, how are you? And sometimes you're like, oh, it's too difficult a question. I have no idea. And so, so they are, they are uh, grieving and bereaved and anxious, and yet they are celebrating and praising God because many have been healed. The signs and wonders are following. And then also, if you read in Mark chapter 6, they're under the pressure of busyness. They're just really busy. We read so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. That's busy. I mean, I'm busy but I'm really good at finding time to eat. <laughs> like, like no matter how busy I am, like, I have a supernatural ability to track down food and eat it. Even sometimes when I'm going to be fasting, you know, <laughs> I, find, I forget and I find myself lining up in a bakery going, I need a pan or raisin. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I'm in full worship mode and then I have that moment of, oh, I'm going to be fasting, it's a disaster. I'm really good at eating. <laughs> 
and, and, and they are so busy they've not eaten. So I want you to get that feeling, that emotion. You know what that feels like when everything is happening and you're strung out and exhausted. And that is the context in which Jesus says to the disciples, come with me by yourself to a quiet place <sighs> and get some rest. Do you, do you see, do you glimpse a little bit of Jesus there? You know that guy who looks constipated in stained glass windows? It's nothing like that. This is the Jesus who sees you in your stress, sees you when you're, you don't know how to answer the question, how are you? Sees you when you're grieving, you're misunderstood, you're too busy to eat. He looks at you, he says, hey, and he calls you by your name. He says, come, come, come with me. Come on, sneak out of the conference. Come on, let's get some rest. Just raise your hand if you think that sounds good right now. <laughs> some of you are so stressed that even when you're watching online in Geneva or Sheffield or Manchester South or Cardiff, you just raised your hand. That's the context for this teaching on prayer. This is the invitation of Jesus to those right now who are struggling with your home life, who are reeling from the sharp sting of bereavement, who are wrestling with unsustainable pressures in your life, who are strung out on Netflix and dopamine hits and screaming kids and the relentless demands of life. And it's because the invitation of Jesus is, hey, come away with me to a quiet place, that we sometimes talk about having a quiet time. This is where it comes from. Uh, when, when Christians talk about having a quiet time, that's code for a bit of time alone with Jesus, with your Bible open maybe, and a, a bit of praying, a bit of talking to Him. And it's this invitation to daily retreat with Him. Now you may say to me, that's all good and fine and dandy, but I struggle to know what to say to God. I, I struggle to, to, to grow in my prayer life. I struggle to hear God. How do I do it? So I want to give you just something, some re four really easy steps that will help you. I guarantee in your prayer life, these are steps so simple, they'll work for a seven-year-old and they'll work for a 70-year-old. And they're super easy to remember. So I, I'm just going to give you this as a tool, which Next time you're there, sitting there, you've got your Bible open on your phone, you're trying to have some quiet time with God, you're thinking, what happens now? These four things will help you, okay? So it goes like this. P-R-A-Y. Just raise your hand if you think, I might be able to remember that. <laughs> the guy is treating us like idiots. It goes like this. P-Pause. Pause. R. Rejoice. A, ask. That's the one we're all really good at. And Y, yield. Yield. So we're just going to go through those four steps together. First of all, when you're coming to pray, okay, it is good to start by stopping. Before you pick up your, 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 your Amazon wish list of things like you need God to do, just put down your prayer list a second, and just be still. That's what uh, we're actually told to do in Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Okay? This may sound obvious, but it's actually the least natural thing to do. So start by stopping. Um, I, I live in Guildford, down uh, in, just south of London, and um, we've got this beautiful cobbled high street. And one day I was walking down the high street and suddenly I heard this weird noise. It was like <laughs> the barking of a dog and there was this clanging, metallic, clattering noise. And, and I sort of paused, thought, what am I hearing? And suddenly this, this greyhound, you know, those super skinny dogs, came charging out of a side street onto the cobbled street. And he still had his lead attached to his collar. And the, and the lead was tied to one of those metal bistro chairs, okay? So, 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 the, so the, the, the bistro chair is like biting his ass and he's terrified and, and people are chasing. And I can only imagine that, you know, because there's a cafe just around the corner there that the owner had diligently tied... You know, they're highly strung, aren't they, those, those greyhounds? They're, like, they're jumpy, they're like neurotic dogs. 
and had tied him up carefully to the bistro chair and gone in to order the, you know, flat white or whatever it is. And then, because they're highly strung, something had happened <laughs> that had made the greyhound jump. And when he jumped, the metal chair jumped. And that is a frightening thing. And of course, that then made the, jet, the, the greyhound jump. And then, and then that was when the, the chair pounced. Now listen, when a metal chair pounces at you, you run. So he starts running. And whereupon the chair rises up and starts whipping his ass. And he's running and people are shouting, get that dog. And as far as I know, that greyhound is still running. <laughs> what did it need to do? Oh yeah. Stop. Sit, be still and everything will come back into perspective. It's only a stinking bistro chair. Can I suggest that some of us today are being chased by great hordes of bistro chairs and you're flipping terrified. And the more you run around in life, the worse it's all getting. And Jesus steps into the midst of all that and says, stop, be still, no, see me. Come away with me to a quiet place and get a little rest. Become fully present in place and time so that your scattered senses re themselves on the ultimate reality, which is the existence of God. It's not God that's not present to you. It's you that is entirely absent to God, right? Just re -center. Notice that in doing this, place seems to be important to Jesus. He says, come away with me to a quiet place. And one of the things I'm learning, and I think we've learned actually over the last 23 years of 24-7 prayer, is the Holy Spirit can fill a place as well as a person. This is, by the way, profoundly Pentecostal. Because if you read very carefully the story of the Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost, we're told that a sound of the Spirit's presence filled the venue before the tongues of fire appeared on their heads. The Spirit filled the place as well as the people. Now, this is significant. And so there is something about finding places in which you encounter Jesus that is really profoundly important. Now, for you, that might just be a special seat in your house. If you're a busy mom, it might be the bathroom. Raise your hand if you've ever had an extended time in the bathroom, <laughs> longer than perhaps was entirely necessary just because you're enjoying the space. I, I, I talked to a builder who said, I get to the, I get to the building site a little early. I... I take a coffee with me and I just have a little bit of time with God before we start the day. I met a teacher. She said she goes into school early and she prays over every desk at the start of the day. I don't know what it is for you, but find your place and your space for a retreat with God. The thing with stillness and silence is they prepare our minds and they prime our hearts to pray from a place of greater faith. Because if you've remembered that God is God and that he's present, you talk in a different way and you expect at another level, right? I have a great friend called Brian, who um, he was in Northern Ireland one day. He was staying with a Protestant couple. You know, obviously in Northern Ireland, it's a big deal with your Protestant or Catholic. He's staying with a Protestant Couple, and he noticed they had a picture of the Pope on their fridge. So he, he's at breakfast. He's not like the sharpest guy in the world, Brian. And he, he says, oh, it's amazing to see that photo on your fridge. It wouldn't have happened a few years ago. And they say, well, thanks. Why do you say that? He said, well, I just think it's incredible in this religious and political and cultural context you got that photo on your fridge. They said, what are you talking about? He said, the photo of the Pope. And his host said, Brian, that's not the Pope, that's my mother. <laughs> oh. 
Guys, it's always a good idea to pause before you speak. <laughs> uh, there's this ancient father of the church called John of the Cross who used this beautiful phrase. He said, he, talk, he said, my house being all stilled. Isn't that beautiful? Some of us, we need to still the house so that we can see clearly and be undistracted in the presence of God. Now, you say to me, okay, I get it. Pause before you do anything else. But how do I do that? And, and I just want to be really simple with you. Just relax, get comfortable, take some deep breaths. I have people in America trying to ban my books being sold because I teach some breathing techniques. And I'm like, dude, if you need a Bible verse to justify breathing well, you're just in deep trouble. I refuse, I mean, I can justify it. You know, Ruach is spirit, which is also breath. I can do it, but I can't be bothered. Just, <laughs> just take some deep breaths for crying out loud. It'll help. So do take some deep breaths, oxygenate. It actually helps break the cycles of stress. You breathe shallow, it increases the levels of stress you're experiencing. You breathe deeply, it slows you down. And then find a little phrase maybe that you can repeat quietly in prayer. It might be praying in tongues. For Franciscans, they say, my God and my all. My God and my all. It might just be thank you, Jesus. It's not really about the words, but by repeating, you're helping to focus your attention in on the moment and on the presence of God. So pause. Now listen, don't get too intense. It might only be a minute of pausing, but that will feel a long time for some of you. But I know other people who say, I start with a pause and it goes on for half an hour and that's the only praying I do. And I say, that's fine. You've just sat in the presence of God. Next, rejoice. Rejoice in God. Again, before you come in with your list, we're told, Philippians 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's always right to give thanks to God. Jesus, when he's teaching how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, says, you know, you start our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It starts with worship before you get into the your kingdom come, your will be done, daily bread stuff. I, I, I travel quite a bit. And um, when our two sons were little, sometimes I'd get home from some trip, I'd be exhausted. I'd walk through the front door looking forward to getting home. I'd open the front door, I'd put my suitcase down in the hall and I'd hear this from upstairs, our two young sons going, Dad, what's for dinner? <laughs> or tell him to start sharing and stop fighting. These would be the words I'd be greeted with. And I would just learn to pause at the bottom of the stairs, go, nice to be home. And then there'd be like silence and you could tell they'd be going, oh yeah, the old man's been away. And they'd come down the stairs. And they'd look up at me, go, welcome home, Dad. And give me a little hug. I'd say, thank you. What's for dinner? <laughs> now, I didn't mind them asking what's for dinner. I'm their dad. But it was just nice they took the time to come downstairs, look at me and say hi. Hello? I mean, this is... If this is basic human courtesy, how much more with your Father in heaven might you just want to take a moment to come downstairs, stare at his face and say, I love you before you make a bunch of demands of him. Rejoice in the Lord always. Give thanks to God for his blessings, his kindness in our lives. How do we do it? Really simple. You got the book of Psalms, try that. Try reading a Psalm. Try building a worship playlist on Spotify or whatever you use. I've got one, it's got everything from Stormzy through to the Hallelujah Chorus. I love the diversity, but find what works for you. Please note it is not fake if you're not feeling it to thank God for it. That is not fake, that's just true. By the way, I must just say, the stuff I'm teaching, these four steps, they don't apply if you're in an aeroplane that's going down. Like, just, you don't have to suddenly reach for a Tim Hughes album. Like, just, just scream help. I'm just trying to teach you how to develop a quiet time, okay? You people. So, A, next one. 
This is now the one we're all really good at, that if you go and talk to the man or the woman in the street, say, what's prayer? They think it's just asking God. We're going to get there now. So A, ask. Jesus says in John 14, verse 14, ask anything in my name and I will do it. Woo! I mean, that's exciting. There is something powerful about prayer. It's become quite kind of cool in certain circles of the church to say, I believe that what happens in prayer, nothing changes out there, just something changes in here. The miracle is me. Now, there is some truth in it, but it's just not biblical. Jesus did miracles. He told us to expect miracles. And He said, when you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, if any of you know anything about Sammy and me, you know we are very honest about unmiracles. We're very honest about unanswered prayer. I've written a whole book called God on Mute about our own struggles with unanswered prayer. So I'm not asking you to kiss your brains goodbye. But some of you find it easier to believe for an unmiracle than for a miracle. You, you've got more faith for God not to do something to disappoint you and break your heart than you have for Him to do what He says in His Word and answer your prayers. We just need to process our pain appropriately. I remember Sammy and I've <laughs> Sammy and I've got some friends. Who, I don't know how to say this appropriately. They're just rich. <laughs> it's just they're rich. They're lovely, and um, they came up to us one day and said, "I say, would you would you like to go on holiday with us?" And now they're the sort of people that when they say that you're just you're just like we're free because <laughs> <You're just> like, <laughs> they have better holidays than us. And the holiday was this. They they hired out a catamaran, you know, one of those dual hull yachts uh, in the Adriatic Sea. And our family had one hull and theirs had the other. And we had this idyllic week sailing around. There were dolphins, the sea was blue. Uh, you know, every night the sun would set and we would just eat al fresco. Uh, it was just unbelievable. And some of you are so stressed right now, you're thinking, I hate this guy. <laughs> I know you do, but it was so good. <laughs> so one night, the sun was just setting. Uh, our kids, we just fished them out of the water and wrapped them in like snuggly white towels. And, and it's like the, the, the water is just still, it's like a mirror. And, and we, we, we've, you know, we've got the dinner out. It's just a perfect moment in your life. And at that exact moment, this just swarm of mosquitoes rose up. And again, some of you are thinking, good. <laughs> Thank you for that. I feel like we're just getting to know each other here and you're being so harsh. And my friend James, who's this very, very successful businessman, he owns quite a few companies that you will have heard of. He immediately prays. He became a Christian in his 20s through a thing called the Alpha Course. And he has this wonderful relationship with God. And he just immediately prays. He goes, oh, dear Father God, would you just take away these mosquitoes now? And, and I'm sitting there going, this is a stupid prayer. <laughs> like, like, this is dumb. Like, like, I don't know. I probably watched the David Attenborough thing about how important mosquitoes are in the ecological cycle, you know. God's kind of busy in Ukraine. Like to worry to op about optimising the alfresco dining arrangements of posh people in the Adriatic. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I've written a book about unanswered prayer. I'm there going, this is, this is stupid. But I look around and my entire family are just going with it. They've got their eyes shut, their hands, oh yes, Daddy God, take away the mosquito. I'm like... Oh. And, and, and I, I mean... I'm thinking this is a nightmare because you know my kids are going to get disappointed and grow up and become like Satanists because of this moment. <laughs> and as all this stuff's going through my head, the most annoying thing happened. I'm still furious about this. <laughs> this, oh, this stupid, like gentle breeze rose up and just blew away the mosquitoes. At that moment, I was so cross. And I'm like, are you kidding me? My heart has been broken by things you didn't do and you do this? <laughs> and it's like, everyone's like, revival has come to our, 
Uh, you know, it was like, oh, hallelujah, thank you, Father. You know. Oh, Christians. Now, I don't know if that was a miracle or just a meteorological fluke masquerading as one, but I do know this. When you ask God for little things, you get to give thanks to God for little things. But if you only ever ask God for really big, important things, you only very occasionally get to live with gratitude. Right? So, so ask, ask, ask for your daily bread, ask for your needs, tell God what is on your heart. That's how relationships go. And we often have to persevere in our asking. Jesus said you will. You know, he, he says, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. He told parables about the necessity of persevering in prayer. There was a, a great, great missionary called Frank Laubach. He's actually the only missionary, American missionary ever to feature on an American postage stamp because his literacy programs taught over a million people to read. And Frank Laubach once tells it like this. I, I love this analogy. He says, prayer works like this. You imagine a man standing by a swamp and he throws a rock in, <laughs> disappears. And he chucks another rock in, gone, another one. And you watch him going, the guy's insane. He's just chucking rocks in a swamp. They're all disappearing. But we all know that if he throws rocks for long enough, eventually one will appear on the surface and another and another and you'll get to walk across. Sometimes with prayer, you just mustn't give up chucking rocks, one rock too soon. Amen? Just keep throwing rocks at the swamp. So much more we could say about this, but finally, why? Yield. Yield. Say yes. If you're teaching this to your kids, just you can swap that tricky word yield for yes. Say yes to God. Yield to him. Romans 12 verse 1 says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That means that in our prayer times, as well as pausing to recenter, as well as giving thanks, as well as bringing our requests before the Lord, we surrender to Him. As Pastor Glynn just said, it's not just about needing a Saviour, it's about having a Lord. It's about saying yes to Him, saying whatever you want to say, you say it, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it because you're in charge and I'm not. Yield to Him. The most important thing that can happen in your time of prayer is not that you say your prayers, but that you become your prayers. That somehow you leave your time of prayer as a prayer and a prophecy. So you've pushed into the presence of God and somehow you leave the presence of God as a carrier of the presence of God into your office, into your family, into your workplace. Right? And by rejoicing in God, you step into the rest of life carrying His favour in a new way. And this is what we call contemplative prayer. And in many ways, this is the highest kind of prayer. And it works like this. In, in contemplative prayer, it starts with me and God. It's like, I'm here God's there and I'm trying to talk to him, I'm trying to focus on him, I'm trying to think about him, but really I'm in the spotlight. And then as I focus on God, as I, as I talk to him, as I give thanks to him, the spotlight starts to shift and it moves from me and God to, to God and me. He becomes my focus. And then sometimes, not all the time in prayer, as you focus on God, what happens? You forget about yourself. And in the beautiful words of Charles Wesley, you are lost in wonder, love and praise. Sometimes maybe that happens in church, you know. It's like the third time through that song and it's like you forget that you're in church, you're just caught up in the presence of God. That's contemplative prayer. It's, it's beyond words. It's communion with God. And this is the desire of all humanity. People who are not Christians still live for this. So for example, when you go to the cinema, Right at the start, it's you and the movie. It's like, I'm, I've paid a lot of money for this. I've got my popcorn, I've got my Coca-Cola, uh, and there's an annoying person behind me on their phone, there's a glow there, but I'm gonna get into this movie because I paid for it, right? It's me and the movie. 
And then if the movie's half decent, then you find that the emphasis starts to shift and it becomes the movie and me. I start to forget my popcorn, forget my Coke, forget the person behind me because I'm getting into the movie. But then if it isn't just a good movie, but a great movie, something happens. You forget you're in a cinema. You ignore your popcorn and your Coke. You get transported. You forget you're watching actors. You are so deeply caught up in it. Those are the great moments of life. You come out, you say to your friends, you've got to see this movie. It's transformative. It's cathartic. It changes you. That's why in moments of sporting euphoria, great art, timeless moments, talking by a fire with a friend, lost in love and wonder at a cinema, These are the great moments we live for in life because they are rumours of another world because you were not created to stare in the mirror. You were not created to be obsessed with yourself. You were created to be caught up in something more beautiful, more wonderful, more hopeful, more colourful, more joyful than you are, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's contemplative prayer. Let me finish. Let me finish with one story. This is a true story about a man called Dominique Voyon. He illustrates everything I've been trying to tell you. Dominique Voyon was a French priest. He had a little monastery in Saint-Rémy, France. And at the age of 54, he found out that he had cancer. And he went to his monks, his brothers, one of whom was my friend, a guy called Brennan Manning. And he, he went to his fellow And it was was Brennan who told me this story first. He went to his fellow monks and he said, I'm dying of cancer and I want to ask you permission to leave the monastery and move to Paris. Because I I want to die amongst the poor. And they gave him permission. Incredible. So he moved, he got a job as a night watchman in Paris and he got a little apartment that only had cold water in a slum area of Paris. And every night after doing the night shift, he'd come back, he'd sit in the park outside his apartment and he'd feed the pigeons. And he'd talk to the men who were still drunk from the night before, leering at girls as they walked by on their way to work. Never judged them, never harsh on them. And then one day they asked him about himself and he told them a little bit about his life. And as they realised he was a man of God, the swearing just stopped. The leering at girls just stopped. A kind of a holiness came into that park. And then one day they realised they hadn't seen Dominique Voyon for a few days and they broke into his apartment and found his dead body. And my friend Brennan Manning says that by his bed they found his journal. It's about the only thing he left. And what he had written, the last words he wrote in his journal are some of the most astonishing things I've ever heard. He said this, all that is not the love of God has no meaning for me. I can truthfully say that I have no interest in anything but the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If God wants it to, my life will be useful through my word and my witness. If he wants it to, my life will bear fruit through my prayers and my sacrifices but the usefulness of my life is His concern and not mine. And it would be indecent of me to worry about that. (laughs) I mean, this is another level. These are his last words. Brennan says, in Dominic Voyom, I saw the reality of a life lived entirely for God and for other people. And after an all night prayer vigil by his friends, he was buried in an unadorned pine box in the backyard of the monastery in Saint-Rémy. A simple wooden cross over his grave with the inscription, Dominique Voyon, a witness to Jesus Christ, said it all. More than 7,000 people gathered from all over Europe to attend his funeral. Listen, I don't know about you, but that's what I long for. Not just to say my prayers, but to be a prayer in the broken places of this world. Not just to experience the presence of God, but to carry the presence of God into the dark places of this world. And by a lifetime of pausing in God's presence, Dominique had become the presence of God. 
and a lifetime of rejoicing always in God's goodness had taught him how to be joyful even when he was dying of cancer and living in a slum. And a lifetime of asking God for all his needs had taught him to trust God's best for his life even when it looked like he was living in an unanswered prayer. And a lifetime of yielding to the Father each day had taught him to surrender even his dying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wonder if we stand together. I said at the start that maybe the invitation to you today here in this auditorium watching online is to come away with the Lord Jesus Christ because of the stress and the pressure that you're living with. Maybe the whole Jesus thing's a little new to you and the way I've described him, you'd love it. And I just want to invite you today, you may want to choose to approach Jesus for the first time. Talk to somebody who seems to know what this is about. Say, I want to find out more about how I get to know Jesus the way that I see you guys do. And they'll love talking to you about that. Or maybe just on your way out today, turn right, go and get your free Earl Grey tea and talk to someone about it. If you're watching online, just message in. But for others, you've been Christians for years. But today God sent me to just bring that simple invitation to you in the busyness and the pressure the broken heart, the stress, come away with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. And so, Lord Jesus, we respond with all our hearts. Teach us to pray. Teach us to walk and talk with you through our lives. Help us to focus less on who we are and how we're feeling than who you are and what you're thinking. Spirit of God, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Would you continually establish them as a house of prayer for all nations? Amen. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. 